Here's what you missed on the last episode. Now that I'm experiencing it uh, and I'm, I'm watching more and more young anglers do it the way you've done it. And you've been, well, you were one of the first I ever see, saw fish this way, even talked about it. And I admit, I go, I don't know about that, you know, but, but, <laughs> but now that I'm observing more and more young anglers, especially these college anglers that are fishing exactly the way you were 10 years ago, uh, and, and they love it. Yeah. They embrace it. So it just depends on what style of game you like to play. And I think their styles in fishing, it's like I used to say, it, it doesn't, fishing doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter if you can run 109 flat or if you can weigh 250 pounds or if you're a woman or a guy or if you're, you know, what color you are. Uh, you, it, it has a place for you. And, and, it, and that's a good thing. You, you're the one that gets to pick it. Yep. So pick mine. Pick yours, pick something in between, you know. Yeah, and I don't think that there's necessarily a time where you have to do both. I think a lot of times I actually adopt your style of fishing a lot of times. I just don't show it in videos because honestly my audience, they want to see the electronics fishing. But when I do go fish up shallow, I'll usually pick up a jig, a crankbait, and that's pretty much it. I'll have two, three different crankbaits, a couple different jigs, maybe a buzzbait or a frog. And my goal is to make in eight hours a minimum of a thousand casts a day, but hopefully 1,500 to 2,000 casts. And to do that, it's literally non-stop casting. And that means I'm not running the boat a lot either. I'm running to a stretch, fishing a huge stretch of water, and then moving on. I'm, like when I'm fishing offshore, I'll go to specific points. And I've heard Brian Thr Thrift even talk about this, where he's like the number one proponent of run and gun. He'll fish up shallow and he'll still fish 30, 40 spots a day. But in one of his podcasts he talked about, he said that on the days he does the worst in tournaments is when he starts getting in that mentality of I'm going to go fish that one or two laydowns on this bank, make a couple casts, run to the next bank, run to the next bank. And he's just constantly moving. He says he's a lot more successful when he'll sit down and he'll pull up to a spot and he'll fish a 50 yard stretch. Even though he came there to fish one laydown or one dock, he expands the area to see if the fish have repositioned or moved. And that's kind of how I've adopted it, but it's a completely different mindset. When I'm fishing offshore, I'm fishing a waypoint. I'm fishing something that's the size of this pillow sometimes, as opposed to when I'm fishing on the bank, it's a 50 yard stretch. Well, and that's, if I have to analyze, which we all do, I've analyzed when do I win the most often yeah. versus when do I just have a so-so tournament or I don't do well at all. And my, I would have to agree with Brian that mine is when I'm trying to cover too much water and my, and my pattern's too spread out. Most of the time when I win, it's not so much that I'm fishing a Pacific, in a, in, but I have chosen the right area. Mm -hmm. And I stay in that area, okay? I don't run around. Yeah. Now the area may be fairly large. It, it may be, you know, a two miles, two square mile area, but it's got, it's got, it's got, it's, it's holding a lot of, Here's the key to those areas. It's holding a lot of alternatives mm. that fits multiple conditions I'm fixing to see during this event. And one of the things I do better now than I've ever done is, is that I don't practice for today. I practice for the first day of the tournament. That's maybe four days away. In other words, I, I, I look at the weather. I, I know the first day is going to be overcast and cloudy. And I practice today, even if today's bluebird, I'm gonna practice for those conditions. And you say, well, how do you do that? I don't, I've worked my butt off in the low light periods. That's gonna be a low light condition. So this is just an example. Because that's gonna be a low light conditions all day the first day. But today, I'm, I'm, I've got to practice hard during what available low light conditions I have today. And that's you just, have an hour of it in the morning. you have an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, so what do you do the rest of the day? Well, you, you try to find an area that has, that you can, you, when it's low light, you got plenty to fish. When it's, then maybe the second day of the tournament's gonna be back to these conditions that I'm fishing right now. So in the middle of the day, I start to fish the conditions that I'll be fishing on the second day or third day. So I'm trying to practice for the conditions I'm gonna see. And that works more often for me when I find an area that is, is a quality area and, that's a, and it, it, it gives me the options to do that. I mean, there's a lot of alternatives. In other words, if the fish are catching them on a buzzbait, 
and it's cloudy and rainy or burning the spinnerbait, and all of a sudden the next day it's bluebird, mm. where are those fish going to be? They're either going to move deeper, so you're going to have to move out and throw a crankbait on, or the, if you've got grass, you've got a lot of shoreline brush, they're going to move tight. So you, you prefer those areas that give you those options. The best, worst mistakes I make sometimes is I have an area that's only good under one option. Mm. It's only good under one condition. And you got to leave it if that condition doesn't exist. And then it forces you into what you described earlier, that you start running all over the place. Uh, and it, ultimately, certain lakes, all lakes, not certain lakes, all lakes have one to three key areas that will win the tournament. 80, 90% of the time. And that changes and week to week, month to month, correct? No. No? No. No, those areas are, will always have the winning fish in them. Gotcha. Now, the way their position will change week to week and month to month, and the way they're, you know, what part of the water column they're using will change week to week, but the areas are usually, there's two or three, maybe four areas in a big lake that the quality fish live and have lived. And there's, and again, that gets back to, my way of thinking, it gets back to nutrients. You're, and you've, you say that, I've heard you talk about offshore, you, it gets back to bait fish and yeah. food. Well, what controls the bait fish and food? Nutrients. Yeah. So, uh, so those areas that have the most nutrients historically will have the most food and thus they'll have the biggest quality of have quality fish. That's so fascinating because I always think about it even a little bit differently than that, which is that I will, I think that there's a certain area of the lake that's going to have the most catchable bass. Maybe that it doesn't ha hold the biggest bass, but I'm almost thinking about trying to determine which two areas of the lake, let's say those two mile stretches, have the most catchable bass that week, as opposed to has the biggest population of bigger fish. For example, if I was going to go fish on uh, Sam Rayburn Lake, I know that maybe in the springtime, the biggest bags of fish may be caught right down there by the dam and you can catch them offshore out of brush piles and stuff. You might get a 30 pound bag out of those lower end, but those fish are very tough to catch over a three or four day tournament. The more catchable bass are up by the bridge, Castle Boykin area, and maybe it's not that it has the biggest population or the biggest fish, but it's that week the most catchable fish. But then maybe other times of the year, the most catchable fish are down by the dam. So I've always thought about less about the areas are productive versus are they catchable that week? But it sounds more like you focus on just trying to find the areas with those bigger fish and figure out a way to get them to bite as if there's always a way to get them to bite. Does that sound right or? Well, it sounds like an evolution. I mean, you just, what you just described was my, the way I made my early career. Yeah. It was, I, I, I could find two pounders faster than anybody. I'm gonna catch more of them than anybody. So I'm fishing for the two pounders are the most catchable fish. Yeah. Okay. Anyone? And back, you got to remember that was back when there was ten fish limits. Yeah. So I didn't care if you caught a few big ones. I'm going to outnumber you in a three or four day of a tournament. I'm going to catch ten every day. Yeah. Okay. Now we know times have changed. Uh, a the limits dropped to five. So now the D Thomas method plays a bigger role. I didn't worry about D Thomas when there was a ten fish limit because he was going to catch bigger fish than me, but I was going to, I was going to outnumber him in three or four days, mm. you know. But now that yeah, I can do that same, I can still do that. I can still go find two pounders faster than you, and I can still catch more than you, even in my age. But I can't outnumber you anymore, and so now I can weigh a two-pound limit every single tournament day of the year and never draw a check, never make a cut, because it's changed. The fishermen have gotten better, the lakes have gotten better, they schedule better lakes, and so now I've had to go to the secondary strategy. It's not about where the most aggressive fish or the most numbers are. It's about, it, to me, I've had to relearn how to catch, uh, not relearn, but focus more on catching a four pound average. Mm. Okay, and, and you look at my history, I used to put a limit on the board every day. Yeah. I don't care if it's a 10 fish limit, a 7 fish limit, or what. I don't put a little board limit on the board every day. So th this relearning in the last 10 years has cost me a lot of consistency in that area. But it's also, I've also weighed the four biggest five fish limits of my life in the last six, seven years. 
So, and that's, that, that, that's why I keep continuing to do it, even though it frustrates me to death at times, because now I know that I'm fishing for the right fish if I'm going to win. Like I caught at St. John's in 2016 and 2019, second at Falcon with, with 37 pound string one day, 35 pound string one day. Uh, so I'm doing the right thing, but okay, am I doing the right thing? No, I'm not. Now I've got to find the balance between those two. And that's where, you know, I think a few anglers have done that. But now I've got to be able to mix that first ideal you mentioned into this, the, the, the second ideal and find the right balance. Because you're dead on. Big fish are going to screw you one day. <laughs> more, more often than not. You know, that little, and even in a given day, that window that you can catch them is so small. It's the smallest window of the day, where two pounders might be you know, half the day where those big fish might be 35, 45 minutes. You better be where they're at when that happens. And I guess that's difference in perspective too as you fishing for the tournaments, lead series, fishing, catching those big fish. When I go to the lake nowadays, it's just, I want to go catch all those active fish. So I'm, I, I love to go catch, you know, five, two pounders. It's great for my videos. I can talk about the topics and I find those active fish. And for most anglers, that's probably what they're looking for. Oh, yeah, they're not needing to go get the big ones, but from your perspective, it's it's very interesting because you're going to go after those sections of the lake where maybe you know the biggest fish in the lake live. They're just so tough to catch and you have to get the conditions right. You have to figure out, maybe it's, you can't get them to bite 90% of the day. You have a one hour window, but you're gonna go sit in that one section of the lake so you don't miss that one hour window as opposed to, like you said, going to catch a bunch of two pounders. And I can see the challenge of trying to balance that because it's like, what if the two hours you go up to the section of the lake where you can catch a bunch of two pounders to get your limit is that same two hour period when the big fish are biting. Well then you've missed it and you missed a check. It, it, the, the strategy in it is so fascinating. Yeah and it, usually you're right it does exist within that when this, those windows are do touch each other. Yeah. Uh, so it's a uh, and I it's been the hardest thing I've had to do in my career because believe me I love catching two pounders. <laughs> I mean I get them sometimes I remember when I first started trying to switch over from catching lemon every day to really focusing more on catching big fish. I'd get on a pattern and windy wind blowing in on the point and the last bush out on the point you could burn a spinner bait and a two pounder was just gonna inhale it every point. And you can see another point you'd, and I'd be I'd run that pattern in practice for an hour, two hours. God this is fun Caught on every fish, and then I go, Rick, they're not going to do you any good. <laughs> you know, they're not going to do you any good. So, 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 you, yeah, the, the, I understand. Hey, don't worry if you're not trying to win this tournament or don't even fish tournaments. Don't worry about that. Just do what is fun, you know. And I, I've had burning a spinner bait, catching a two pounder is is fun. So I guess I want to get into how to find that best area of the lake for the big fish versus the numbers. Because I know a lot of guys, they don't want to go fish for six hours with no bites and then with the potential of maybe catching a 25 pound bag, but maybe not catching any fish at all. Some people just want to go catch two pounders. So let's just kind of get into how you go about finding those areas where you just go catch two pounders versus finding the areas for the big ones. I think I've understood that ever since I finally started figuring out pattern fishing. Mm. Uh, I, I started understanding that like in 1976 and 77 because it worked when I, when I applied it. And it was simply, I was fortunate enough to fish some of the biggest lakes in the country when I was in the Pasadena Bass Club in the late 60s and early 70s. To lead a band, Rayburn. 187,000 acre lake, 112,000 acre lake. And yet you could see those lakes, they had both, they had numbers, and, but they had big fish. Uh, so I, the ideal situation was to find an area that had both. I mean, uh, and what I've found, there was one area that tended to have both. Uh, it, and it, it, it was defined by the obvious, which is habitat. Okay. All, the, we all know that the number one habitat for largemouth bass is aquatic vegetation. So that, that took a, that took a easy, that's a pretty easy one. You know, you, I could fly a lake and see every bit of aquatic vegetation in the lake in, in 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, so that was one variable, but what was the other variable? And the other variable probably was obviously how does the bass get big? And it gets big by eating. 
and having plenty of food. And so what, what, uh, what dictates where it has that? And it was, that became something less obvious to people. And it'd be simply nutrients. And in that big lake, I learned over time, the thing that had, let's take away the aquatic vegetation even, the thing that had the most habitat and the most nutrients were the biggest creeks that fed the lake. They washed in nutrients, they washed in logs, they washed in brush, they washed in a little bit of everything. And so when I started fishing in classics in 76 and 77, I basically started isolating the biggest, the, the creeks that had the biggest nutrient flow coming into the lake. And, uh, and most of the time it proved out that those were the creeks that had more food because of the nutrients, shad populations, brim populations, uh, crawfish, versus sterile areas, which I'd see out in the desert that didn't have a lot of that, e any of those. Uh, so e even when I won at the U.S. Open at Lake Mead, the one, the one that I rem will remember for area, forever, I, I was in the most nutrient area of the whole lake, which was the Colorado River coming out of the Grand Canyon. So, uh, so I really keyed on that, and still to this day, I will say that's the number one thing I will look at is what are the biggest creeks feeding this lake. And nowadays you can go in with Google Earth and you can see the ones that stay the muddiest the most more often than not, because they're feeding in a lot of nutrients. Gotcha. You know, and uh, so uh, even though currently it may have been in a drought and you can't really tell that when you're there. Well, you can go to Google Earth now and look back through time, and it'll show you those lakes that had got, and they look terrible when you're looking at them on Google Earth, but that's nutrients. Yeah. And as long as it'll stabilize, which it does, then that's, the, hey, there's the creeks. There's, maybe you've got three creeks in the whole lake, and that's the ones that you need to be focusing your attention on, both for numbers and, and for large fish. That's so interesting. That's it's funny because I take a similar approach, but I do it from an electronics perspective. And what I do is I want to try to start by finding the creeks with the major, the most bait fish first. That's like my first kind of key is looking for threadfin chad, gizzard chad, and I will literally launch my boat when I get to the lake almost every time I go and just start driving in the middle of pockets and creeks and out on the main lake. And I'm looking for big balls of bait fish on my fish finder over 100 foot of water, or 50 foot of water, or the deepest section of the lake and I've found that I can actually isolate 200 yard sections of creeks that have a large quantity of bait fish and what I've able to do is then determine that that area because as the good quantity of bait fish is a nutrient rich area and I can I was on Sam Rayburn Lake doing a bass camp in January and I actually I spent my one practice day running up and down the lake and literally pulling into every single creek and I graphed the first the main lake first third of the creek middle of the creek and back of the creek and I determined that over there's two two mile sets or two like mile sections mile and a half sections where there were the first third of every creek in those sections had a lot of bait fish in them. And in one section of the, the lake, that one one mile section, there was a lot of grass. And in the other one mile section, there wasn't any grass, but there was a lot of good offshore structure. And I was able to go out for the rest of that week and on days when you had bright bluebird skies, no wind, catch them offshore in that one section of the lake that had bait fish all over it. And we were catching 20, 30 fish a day. And then we were able to go to the section of the lake that had all the bait but had the shallow grass on the days when it was cloudy, windy, and catch them up shallow. And so I had a section for each condition. And it was fascinating because they had an FLW tour event that next week on Sam Rayburn. And of the guys in the top 10, six of them were in those two sections of the lake that I determined my practice day. No one was fishing in any of the other stuff I didn't graph. So I was able to narrow it down just with my electronics, which is rare because you have to have gizzard chad, threadfin chad, stuff like that. But it's so fascinating that I was able to figure that out. Well, and what you did, we had to used to do, I could determine historically the creeks that had the most nutrients, yeah. but I couldn't, I couldn't determine until I got on the water as precisely or as quickly as what you did is exactly on Rayburn and Toledo Bend, these creeks can be pretty big. <laughs> so, and you're right, they're not necessarily in the whole creek. Mm -hmm. Depending on a certain season, they could be in the middle, the mouth, they could be all, all the way back in the back. Yeah. So what you're doing with your electronics is immediately determine what part of the creek are they using. I had to get there. I had a way of doing it that they've now outlawed. 
uh, you could fly a creek, you could fly. And I used to, me and some of the other anglers used to rent a little, you know, airplane and fly the lake for an hour, hour and a half. And you could fly these creeks and a lot of times you could see from the birds the section that was holding the, the bait fish. Yeah. So what you're doing now with electronics, I, I had other ways of trying to speed that process up. You know, flying it or sometimes you had to go in there and just look for them. And then I would look for them with my depth finder too, or see them on the top at certain times of the day. But here's the reverse of that. What if the whole lake just got shed? That is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating because that becomes a real bummer, you know. Here's what to look forward to on the next episode. I'm starting to see though, like I know when Cody Huff won Toledo Bend, he, he was, these bass were following those schools long distances. Okay, which most of us coming from the early time frames of fishing, bass fishing, we looked at a, a bass as being kind of a sedimentary creature. He had a small territory and he stayed in that territory. That may have been true, but see a bass, we create, lakes are not a bass prime, that's not his original habitat.